We previously learned about many different ways of categorizing systems based upon their behavior. We could look at them as linear or nonlinear, time invariant or time varying, causal or non-causal. In this lecture, we look at an important property of systems that divides systems into two categories, once again, and that is whether the system possesses stability. System can be either stable or unstable. We want to understand precisely what this term means and how we can test for stability or instability. Back when we discussed linear and nonlinear systems, I mentioned that linear systems can have only one equilibrium, while nonlinear systems can have many equilibria. This is important when we consider stability. What this means is that a linear system has to display either stable or unstable behavior. The stability of a nonlinear system is much more tricky because it's highly dependent upon the initial conditions and the input. As we'll discuss in more detail in just a minute, stable means either a diminishing output or a bounded output depending upon the definition that is being used. There actually are many definitions of stability. In this class, we'll consider two, one with respect to the input and one with respect to the initial conditions. In this presentation, we'll use an analogy for understanding the concept of stability better. Here's our analogy. We have a ball located at the bottom of a trough it's in equilibrium at this position, and it remains motionless. Now, if that was the whole story, this would not be very interesting. What we're going to do is look at the behavior of the ball at the bottom when we conduct certain tests. And we'll look at two different kinds of tests. In one test, we'll disturb the initial position of the ball. And in the other test, we'll apply a force to the ball to move it. The behavior of the ball under these two different tests corresponds to two different kinds of stability. So here is our first test. We'll disturb the initial position of the ball, and then it will undergo some motion, responding to this initial condition. Ultimately, it will return to the bottom, to the equilibrium, due to friction. We say that this equilibrium is stable with respect to initial conditions, because it returns back to the equilibrium after the initial conditions have been disturbed from the equilibrium. Now here is our second test of this equilibrium. If we were to add a very small disturbance force to the ball, the ball would not return to the equilibrium. It would move away, but it wouldn't move very far away if the force was small. It would stay there, away from the equilibrium, until the force was removed but it would stay close to the equilibrium. So this is another kind of stability. This is stability of the equilibrium with respect to an input, in this case, the force. Note that this kind of stability does not require the ball to return back to the equilibrium while the force is being applied, but it does require the ball to stay close. So we've seen two different kinds of stability now for this equilibrium. One is stability with respect to a disturbance of the initial conditions. The other is stability with respect to an input. Now we'll consider the case of a ball at the top of a hill. Now, if it's at the very top and it's not disturbed, it will stay there. There will be no force to move it away. So this is also an equilibrium. If we disturb the initial position of the ball and we move it slightly away from the top, the ball will not return to the top of the hill. It will roll down. So it doesn't return back to its equilibrium in this case. So this is an instability of the equilibrium with respect to initial conditions. Now we'll consider a second test of the ball at the top of the hill. So we put it back at the equilibrium, and now we apply a small disturbance force. And the force may be very small, but that force will move the ball away from the equilibrium. 
and the ball will not stay close to the equilibrium, it'll keep moving away, no matter how small that force is. So we say that this equilibrium is unstable with respect to the input. It doesn't stay close, even for a very small force. So now we've seen two different kinds of instability of this equilibrium. An instability with respect to initial conditions and an instability with respect to an input. So there are two types of stability for an equilibrium. One is stability of the equilibrium with respect to a change in initial conditions. And you can think of this as a zero input case. The other is stability of an equilibrium with respect to an input. And you can think of this as a zero state case. And the terminology we use for these two different kinds of stability is internal stability for stability of an equilibrium with respect to initial conditions and external stability for stability of an equilibrium with respect to an input. In future presentations, we'll discuss the mathematical conditions for these two kinds of stability. We'll provide tests which will allow you to determine the stability of a system from the model. We'll also discuss the relationship between these two different kinds of stability and when one implies the other. To review, internal stability looks at whether the output returns to zero after the initial conditions are moved away from the equilibrium values. Recall that for external stability, we're looking at the stability of the system in response to an input. We can expect the output to go back to its equilibrium value when it's being disturbed by the input. So we need a new idea about how to think about stability. So for external stability, we're going to ask that the system output behave nicely when a nice input is applied. Don't be concerned if you don't completely understand the notions of stability and instability. We'll be discussing it much more in future presentations. But right now, I want to introduce the idea of internal and external system descriptions. This is important to the discussion of stability and instability. And what we need to know about this at this point is that there are different kinds of models that we can make of systems. Some are external descriptions and some are internal descriptions. An external description describes how an input affects an output. An internal description describes not only this, but also what's going on inside the system about all the variables that are involved. Obviously, if you have an internal system description, you can see all the signals within the system. Nothing is being hidden. And from an internal system description, you can get an external system description. But the reverse is not true. If you have an external system description, you may not be able to get an internal system description from it. There could be signals that are hidden and behaviors you are unaware of. 